Awesome. Well, good morning. Welcome to Church at the Grove. My name is Nathan, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are thrilled uh, that you guys are with us this morning as we are kicking off a new series called Making Change this morning. Um, But before we jump into that, uh, real quick, everybody should have got one of these when you came in the door, and uh, we ask for everybody to do this together, whether it's your first time with us or if you're a regular attender. uh, You can also download the Church at the Grove app, and you can fill out an encounter card straight from uh, your cell phone. You can uh, just download the app and uh, uh, fill it out on there. Um, But if you would, rip off the bottom section that we call the encounter card. Uh, Give us as much information as you feel comfortable giving to us on the front. If you are a first-time guest with us, we're not going to show up at your house unannounced. We just want to have a record of your visit and send you a little gift this week in the mail just to say thank you so much for being part of our services today. And then on the back is a place for prayer requests and comments. It's a way for you to communicate with our church family about what's going on in your life and how we can best pray for you in the week ahead. And we do consider that to be one of the greatest privileges and honors uh, that we get to do that each and every week is pray for you. Um, there's also some way for you to take some next steps. Uh, maybe you've been around Church at the Grove for a while now, or maybe you've only been here for a few weeks, and uh, you would like to know about how you can get better connected in the life of the church. And so we've got serve teams um, that are on this sheet right here. If you should have got this volunteer sheet, um, we would love for you to get plugged in and serve in some degree on Sunday mornings here at Church at the Grove. Um, We say that saved people serve people. That's who we are. That's part of our identity. And so we want to be servant-minded people. And so um, we had an incredible response last week. Um, We had uh, 18 new uh, children's volunteers that signed up. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the only problem with that is I said I needed 25, all right? Um, so we still have a handful of you guys that weren't listening to the Lord, and you need to dig in this morning and take that step of faith. Um, but uh, really, regardless of where maybe God's leading you, we would love for you to sign up and get plugged in and serve. We got community groups kicking off. And then we've also got... Um, uh, a membership gathering, our Covenant Family membership gathering. It's going to be next Saturday night. Um, and so if you want to be a part of that, you can just put that on your encounter card, check that box, or you can fill it out on the app or talk to me afterwards, and we'd love to get you information about that. Um, but we're kicking off a new series this morning um, talking about making change. And we just came off this series called uh, Do You Even Lift, which is all about us trying to live uh, in a, a way this year to 2019 to be the healthiest we possibly could in our spiritual lives. And then we're coming right off of that, and we're jumping into this series that's dealing mainly with our financial lives and how we spend and use the money that God has entrusted us in our possession. And so I know before we kind of go any farther, I'll just go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Uh, We are at church, and we are talking about money um, for the next four weeks. Now, for some of you in the room, you're going, great. This is what I knew about church. All they want to do is talk about money, and they just want my money. Like, that's just what the church is all about. This is why I didn't go to church anymore is because it seems like all they care about is money. First off, let me say, we haven't done a financial series in about two years. And secondly, we don't want anything from you, okay? This series is not about wanting anything from you over the next four weeks. It's all about wanting something for you that we believe that the best way that we can live our lives is according to Scripture and according to God's commands. That when we follow God and when we follow Jesus and we live our lives according to His Word, that our lives get better. That it makes us better at life when we follow the way that God instructed us to live. And so we just want to share some practical insights from God's Word about how He says we should use the money that He's put in our possession. And we believe that if we'll follow the commands of God and we'll follow His commands when it comes to our financial lives, then we'll receive blessings out of that. And so that's what we want to talk about, because this series is ultimately not wanting something from you, but wanting something for you. And ultimately, what we want for you over the series is freedom. Like um, for most Americans, for most people probably sitting in this room this morning, you have uh, struggled in your financial lives. I mean, if you're breathing, we've all made financial mistakes at one point or another in our lives. And some of us are still reaping the consequences of those decisions. We've got massive amounts of debt and we've got all these financial stress and struggles in our lives. But just imagine for a second, what if none of that was there? 
Like, how would your life be different? Like, how great would it be if you could walk to the mailbox and not be afraid of the bills that would potentially be in there because you had enough money set aside to pay for them? How great would that be? How great would it be if you had some financial margin in your, in your life where if there was an emergency, if there was something that was a catastrophic, God forbid, that happened in your life, that it wouldn't put you in financial uh, destitution, destitute, is that right? Financial destitute, right? That it wouldn't be this issue in your life, but instead you had the freedom from your finances, that your finances didn't own you, but you own your finances. They didn't tell you what to do, but you tell your money where it's going to go and how it's going to work for you. And that's, the core, that's what we want to accomplish over the course of this series. And we're going to look at four different things um, over the four weeks. So the first thing is less is more, which we'll hit on this week. Stress is bad, giving is good, and tomorrow matters. You can see that on the screen behind me, I believe. Why don't we say those together to try to ingrain them into our minds this morning. So ready? Less is more, stress is bad, giving is good, and tomorrow matters. Y'all are doing really good. Let's do it one more time just to kind of get this into our heads. Okay, ready? Less is more, stress is bad, giving Giving is good and tomorrow matters. That's what we're talking about over the next four weeks. And today, we're hitting all on this idea that less is more. It seems like an oxymoron. It doesn't seem like that makes sense, but it is indeed true that less can be more when we have the right things in our lives. Now, I have this personality where I kind of have this overindulgence personality. I don't know if anybody else can uh, relate to this a little bit, but like at our house, like if there's like, if Caitlin makes a tray of cookies, like I don't just walk by and grab one cookie Um, or I might walk by and grab one cookie, but I'm going to quickly turn around and grab two more as I walk back by the other way until eventually like I've had six or seven or eight cookies and the tray of cookies is completely gone. Does anybody else struggle with this? Am I okay? Good. I'm not the only one in the room. I can remember being in middle school and uh, my mom made some banana nut bread. Anybody like banana nut bread? I love banana nut bread. I made this right uh, this morning, right before I got here. Um, it's actually still a little bit warm. And so I can remember that I, um, my mom made this banana nut bread, and uh, hers was probably a lot better than mine that I threw together this morning. And so I can remember cutting off a piece, and you know what's so good with banana nut bread? It's really great if you put butter on it. And it, the best way to do it, and we can't do it because we're up on stage here this morning, but the best way to do it is to have like a stick of butter, you know, you cut it off little slices, and then you just stick it in the toaster oven and let it melt and it just like, you know, soaks into the bread. The best I can do this morning is our spray butter, um, which, you know, probably kills you, but I'm going to spray some butter on there. And you, you eat the banana bread and it's warm and it's soaking up. I mean, it's like almost soggy because it's so much butter that's in, inside and then it's crispy on the outside. And so I can remember getting banana bread when I was in middle school and taking a bite of it and just going, man, I love me some banana bread. Like this is good, good stuff. And mm. And that's pretty good too. I, I mean, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but that's pretty good banana bread. And so for me, I ate a piece of banana bread and I was like, man, this is good. So what would be better? Another piece of banana bread, right? Everybody gets that, right? So what do I do? I go to the loaf, I cut off another piece and I eat another piece. So that's great. Everything's good. One or two is better than one. So that must mean that three is better than two. So I go back and get another piece until I had pretty much eaten the entire loaf of banana bread, which doesn't seem in and of itself like a terrible thing because it's bananas. Come on, it's healthy for you. It's banana bread. Come on. It has nuts in it too, so it has protein. So it's great, right? So I can remember eating this whole loaf, but the problem was that about 30 minutes to an hour later, I happened to taste the banana bread again, right? I got so sick to my stomach that instead of it going down, it came back up, and I remember getting so sick because I ate so much banana bread, and, and, and it took me years to eat banana bread again because every time I tasted banana bread, I thought about that incident where I was throwing up banana bread, and it was just terrible, and so just because more seems like it's the right answer, just because more seems like it would be better, doesn't always mean that's the case. Sometimes less is indeed more. One piece of banana bread is good. A whole loaf of banana bread, not so much. But this is how we live our lives a lot of times, where we think in the world and the culture that we live in, that if one is good, 
then two is better, right? So if one shirt is good, then two would be better. If one car in the garage is good, then two would be better. If one pair of shoes is good, then two pairs of shoes is even better. It's this idea that more is always better. And this is prominent and and distinct in our culture for sure, but it's not new. It's been something that's existed since the beginning of time. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, had all the fruit and all the trees that they could eat from, right? They had as much fruit and as much food as any person could ever want. And the enemy comes, Satan comes as the serpent, and he tempts Adam and Eve to eat the tree, eat from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. And why, what did he tempt them with? He tempted them with this idea that you need this. If you eat this, if you partake in this, then you'll be like God. You're missing out. You need more in order for your life to be complete. And so this is how the enemy has come into our lives from the very beginning of time and tried to tempt us into buying into the the lie that if we get more, then our lives will be better. And that's so true in our society, in our culture, in our world today, because we've filled our lives with so much stuff that we miss out on really focusing in on who Jesus is and him ultimately being all that we need. And so this morning, I want us to look at this idea that less is indeed more. And to kind of prove that this morning, we're going to look at one verse of scripture, just one, um, and we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you have a Bible that's in the Old Testament, um, it'll be on the screen behind me as well if you want to follow along. But Ecclesiastes is a book written by a man named Solomon. And Solomon was the wisest man that's ever walked this planet. God had given them the supernatural ability to be wise beyond his years. And not only did he give him incredible wisdom, but God gave him incredible wealth. And his kingdom was so incredible that kings and queens and foreign dignitaries would travel long distances to come and to see Solomon's incredible kingdom. There was nothing that Solomon could not get that he wanted. If he wanted a bigger bedroom, he could get a bigger bedroom, right? If he wanted granite countertops in his house, he could get granite countertops in his house. If he wanted another wife or a hundred wives, he could get that because he was Solomon and there was nothing that he could not put in his hands and get in his disposal. He was incredibly wealthy and incredibly wise all at the same time. And his wealth became a deterrent. It became something that really hindered him in life and led him down the roads that he wished he probably never would have come down. And in Ecclesiastes, he's writing over the course of his life. And he says this in Ecclesiastes 4, 6, he says, better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Let me say that again. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Solomon understood something. Even with all of his wealth, even with all of his splendor, with all of his greatness, he understood that better is one hand full with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. He understood that. Because with one hand full, you have an other hand empty. And with one hand empty, you can help a friend up. You can serve someone else. You can give to other people. But when you have both hands full and you're grasping, it brings strife. It brings toil into your life. It brings hardship. Less is more, and more is not always more, right? He understood this principle. So here's the idea for us to think about this morning. What truly matters in your life? Like, here's the thing. Like, imagine the scenario for a second that you got a terrible phone call from the doctors tomorrow morning. And the doctor said, hey, I am so sorry to tell you this, um, but we think that you only have a few months to live um, here because of whatever else is going on in your body. And they gave you months to live. What would be the things that would go through your mind in that moment? I'm sure there'd be sadness, there'd be frustration perhaps, there might even be some anger, Um, there'd be a number of emotions, but what would you value in that moment? Would it it be, you know, man, you know what I really need right now? I need a new car. 
Is that what would be going through your mind? Or you know what, the, the iPhone X, R, S, whatever it is, like it just came out and man, you got, you got to see this screen. It's huge and the camera is incredible and it can do this portrait and selfie mode. Like it's incredible. I've got to get my hands on the iPhone X, R. Like that's what I really need. That's not going through your mind in that moment, right? You're not thinking about getting new flooring in your house. You're not thinking about getting new countertops in your kitchen. You're not thinking about what new car you can drive. In that moment, you're thinking about what really matters in life. And it always comes down to relationships. It comes to our relationship with God. It comes down to our relationship with our family. It comes down to our relationship with friends. And maybe we think about how we want to prepare our kids maybe for what they want uh, after we leave here, what they can have in the future and how we can best protect them and, and motivate them for the future. It always comes down to people because people is what matters in our lives. And when the time is short and when we realize that our life is near the end, everything becomes clearer and our perspective becomes focused on those relationships. But why is it that we don't live like that every single day of our lives? Why is it that we don't live with the end in mind? No one ever goes to a funeral and talks about how great somebody's house was. No one ever goes to a funeral and talks about how she had so many pairs of shoes in her closet. No one talks about that. Why? Because it doesn't matter. But yet, it's what we fill our lives with. And it's what we chase after so, too, so often. We lose sight of this idea that better is one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. We miss out on that truth. So how do we live that life? How do we live the life that less is indeed more, where we don't seek after more and more stuff to fill our lives and try to bring us satisfaction and joy, but instead we focus on Jesus and the things that matter in life, that Jesus is our ultimate contentment and fulfillment and joy. How do we get to that place? There's three things I want us to focus on this morning. And the first thing is this, is that we cut back, that we cut back. Again, better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. We've got to cut back in our lives, that we've got to realize that we don't need as much stuff as we have. Um, it's funny that um, Caitlin and I last, uh, I guess it's been almost two years now, um, we moved uh, literally a mile down the road um, to a house right across the street from here. And uh, it was built in the 70s. So we moved from a house that was built in like 2010. Um, it was, you know, new, nice. I mean, it had everything, you know, all the modern luxuries. And we moved to a house that was built in the 70s. And fortunately, we were able to do some remodeling and bring it up to date. But it's so interesting when you go into the houses that were built in the 70s and you see how people lived back then, which some of you guys can remember that. And some of you guys have no clue about the 70s. Um, but you walk into these houses and you go into the master bedroom and the master bedroom is like big enough for a bed. Like, and that's it, you know? And then you open up the closet and it's just like these like, like sliding doors and it's just like, you know, a three foot by six foot kind of section. And that's where the husband and the wife put all of their clothes. Like how crazy is that? You go into the other bedrooms and they're teeny. Um, our house didn't have a garage. It, had a, it has a carport. And so, you know, there's no garage storage. And you, we moved into this house and we had all of this stuff. And I'm going, where are we going to put all of our stuff? How in the world do people live like this? Because you go into any house that's being built today, it doesn't really even matter what, uh, what price range of house you're looking at. Any house that's built today, you go in and they have large master bedrooms, they have huge master walk-in closets that are some, in some cases big as bedrooms that you can go in and you can store all of your stuff. And for some of you, you have houses like that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. We're not, we're not trying to shame you or make you feel guilty in any way. We're just acknowledging the reality of our lives and our world today. And so you walk into your closet that you maybe have today, and it's this big walk-in closet, and you've got clothes from floor to ceiling and from wall to wall, and you walk in and you look at all of your clothes and you say what? I have nothing to wear, how crazy is that, right? And for some of us in the room, we say that we have nothing to wear and we have so many clothes, perhaps, that we can't even fit them all in the closet. 
So we maybe have to use another closet somewhere else in the house, or we have to box them up and we have to put them in the garage or the attic or in the basement so that we can store them. Like, how crazy is that? Some of us have so much stuff that our garages are full and we can't even put a car in the garage if we wanted to. Listen to this. This is how crazy it is. Some of us have so much stuff that we can't fit our stuff in our house and in our garage, so we box it up and we take it to some other place where we actually pay money for a storage unit so that we can store more of our stuff that we completely don't use, that we don't even realize is even there anymore, and we pay a monthly fee so that we can store all of our stuff. That's, that's a normal thing in our culture. There are storage facilities all over this community that are full of people's junk that they don't typically even use. They don't even know that they have. And that's where our world has come, right? And so if we're ever going to live with this idea that better is one hand full of tranquility than two hands full of toil and chasing after the wind, we've got to understand this principle that we've got to cut back. We've got to say no. We've got to say, these things in life are not going to bring me satisfaction and fulfillment. Jesus himself said that your life doesn't consist with the abundance of possessions, that your life is so much more than that. Your life has so much more meaning and purpose than that. Your life has value, and your life is so much more than the possessions that you have. That's what our lives are called to be. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to cut back. The second thing we have to do is we've got to clear out. We've got to clear out. Clear out as if your life depended on it. For most of us, we have so much stuff and so much clutter, and I know this doesn't seem like it's a spiritual principle, but I promise you it is, that there's so much stuff that we have in our lives that we can't think, we can't hear from God. Our lives are stressful. Our lives are busy. We have no kind of just peace in our lives because there's just so much stuff all around us. And we got to come to a place where we have to clear out, clean out. We have to get rid of some of our stuff. I don't know, this has kind of been all the rage now. If you are a Netflix fan and you've been following kind of recent stuff, you know that there's this new show that's come out called Tidying Up. Anybody seen this? Okay, Tidying Up. Uh, it's this Chinese Asian lady, um, and she uh, is Marie Kondo, and she is making it her mission um, where she goes to these people's houses and she helps them tidy up. But by tidying up, that really means that she makes them get rid of a bunch of stuff that they have in their house. And these aren't like hoarders. like These are just like normal everyday people that she goes into their houses and helps them out. So I've watched a couple of the episodes, and uh, she's crazy. I mean, I'll just go ahead and say it. She's, she's crazy, and she's very much into the kind of Asian, way of life and mentality. And so the first thing she does when she comes into the house is she finds kind of a central location. She gets down on her knees and she greets the house. You know, she welcomes herself and introduces herself to the house. Like it's kind of crazy. And then the first thing she always does is she starts with people's clothes. And she makes them pull all of their clothes out of the closet, all their clothes out of the drawer, and put them all on the bed. And you should see the massive amount of clothing that just begins to pile up. I actually did this on Friday and Saturday with my own clothes, and I was shocked at how many clothes that I had. And then she makes them go through each individual item, and she asks the question, does this item spark joy in your life? which is a little silly, right? Because it's an article of clothing. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have any real purpose in our lives. But does this item bring joy to your life? And if it doesn't, she says, then talk to it, which is another weird thing. She says, talk to the shirt and tell the shirt, you know, or tell the pair of pants or whatever it might be, tell it, thank you for serving a purpose in my life. Now go serve a purpose in somebody else's life and either donate it or sell it or do whatever to get rid of it. Now that's crazy, But what's so interesting, at the end of every single episode, there's families, there's people with kids, without kids, there's uh, people that are married, there's people that are dating, there's all kinds of people. And at the end of every single episode, without fail, after people go through and they clear out their house, every single one of them says, man, I feel like I can breathe. I feel like I have a deeper sense of peace in my life. Man, I feel like our relationship with our kids is stronger. I feel like I can relax in my own house now. My wife and my, and my husband, we've, we've, our relationship has gotten stronger because we have less stuff. 
Because stuff and clutter and a bunch of possessions is not really what our life is all about. And just having more and the abundance of more stuff isn't ever going to bring us joy and satisfaction. If I'm working out at my office and um, uh, I always work better um, if I have a clean desk than if, if everything's cluttered and there's papers everywhere. Like I just can't focus when there's so much stuff around. And that's the same thing that's true in our life. We have to clear out so that we can focus on the things that really matter. And when we get rid of some of the stuff, and when we get rid and we clear out and we tidy up and we remove some of the, the, the junk that we have, we begin to fo- be able to focus on what really and truly matters in our lives. And that's the relationships with others, our relationship with God. We're able to focus and look to him for our peace and our joy. And here's what else happens. As you clear out, you begin to see the things that truly matter. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about, you know, Netflix, for example, is there's, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of shows that you can watch. I mean, we, we never had this, you know, when I was a kid growing up. I mean, it was what you had on TV um, or you rented a DVD, but there was nothing that you could just on demand watch thousands of shows at any point in your life. And so now you can do that. You can binge watch anything you want to watch. But here's what I do every time Netflix comes up on the screen and I'm thinking about what I'm going to watch. I flip through that menu for like 30 minutes, you know, and I'm just looking, what am I going to watch? You know, and because there's so many choices and there's so many options that it's hard for me to make a decision. But yet if I were to go on a plane and I was to watch, you know, the the on-demand movies they have on the back seats and the little screens, like they only have like 10 options. And it's super easy for me to pick something because there's less options. Same thing if you went to the Cheesecake Factory. Anybody ever been to the Cheesecake Factory? You got to love the Cheesecake Factory. But if you sit down and you order off the menu, their menu is like 100 pages. I mean, it is like a book. They have to have it spiral bound because it's so thick. And they have everything you could possibly ever want. And you sit down at the table and you're just flipping page after page after page, looking at all of this stuff. And it's so difficult to make a decision. Why? Because there's so many options. And when we begin to clear out and we begin to get rid of the clutter and we begin to downsize, man, it's easier for us to think. It's easier for us to make decisions. It's easier, easy for us to not focus on the stuff that we have, but rather the relationships that matter. Better is one hand with, handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. So when we clear out, it's when we get a new shirt, we give a new shirt. When we get a new pair of pants, we give a pair of pants. When we get new underwear, we get, well, maybe not give new underwear, right? But, but we, we give when we get. We get and then we give because we, our lives, are not defined by the abundance of stuff. Our lives are so much more than that. So we're going to cut back, we're going to clear out, and then we're going to pay back or pay off. Um, we'll hit more on this next week when we talk about stress is bad. But for many of us, because of all the stuff that we've had, we have gone into an incredible amount of debt. Um, The average credit card debt in America is $16,000 per person, all right? Now, for some of you, you go, man, I'm in a lot better shape than I thought. And others of you are going, oh, no, like I'm way worse than average, right? But that's the average. That's the average. And that doesn't even include student loans and mortgages and car payments. Like that goes way higher than that when you start factoring all that stuff in. But because of all these stuff that we've acquired, because of this thinking in our mind that, man, we need this. We've got to have this. We've gone into so much debt. And we've gotten things that aren't going to help us. They aren't going to bring joy into our lives in any way. But we've got it because in the moment, we thought we needed it. And some of us have even gone into debt to get some of the stuff that we have in our possessions. And if we're going to understand this idea that less is more, then we've got to come to a point where we're willing to pay off and to give back what we have um, borrowed. That debt doesn't make anyone's life better, right? No one goes, man, I'm so thankful that I'm in debt. Like no one ever says that, right? And I can sleep so soundly at night because I know that I've got a 19% interest rate on my credit card. No one says that. But instead, people say, I'm so stressed. I don't know how we're going to make ends meet this month. 
We're living paycheck to paycheck. And because of that, there's stress and there's anxiety. And it all comes from this idea that I'm gonna buy things that I don't need to impress the people that I don't really even like in order to bring joy somehow to my life. And so if we're going to be the people that live with less is more, then we've got to be willing to cut back, to clear out, and to pay off. And the reason we do this is because our lives are not about the abundance of possessions, but it's about our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Because better is one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been on a, a foreign mission trip. Um, I've been on a few over the course of my life, and I can remember the very first one I ever went on uh, was to Mexico. And so we flew to Harlingen, Texas, a little city right there over the border, and we drove across the border, and we went probably two or three hours to the main kind of inland of Mexico. And uh, we, we got there, we got to the kind of compound we were staying in, and the first day we were gonna go to this village, and uh, the whole mission trip was going to be about us building a church for this village. And so we were working with missionaries that were on the ground there day after day. And so we were going to go in and we were going to build this church. And so we went to this village and it was a squatter village. And these people literally had absolutely nothing. And I mean, you pull up to this village and they're just these huts. They're not even permanent structures. I mean, they're just like trash and sticks and you know dirt that they've kind of formed into homes. And they're living there just kind of in these squat like, you know, squatted positions. Like they're just, they're just throwing things together in order to provide shelter for their house. And they don't have electricity and they don't have indoor plumbing and they don't even have really running water in this village. And we pull up and you're, you're just immediately heartbroken. You see these kids running around and, you know, they're lucky if they have a shoe on, you know. Um, you're, they're, their clothes are tattered. There's holes in them. And they're running around and you're just going, oh, my gosh, I feel so bad for these people. Man, that's, that's the first thing that happens when you go on a mission trip the very first day. That's kind of how your mind goes. I feel so bad for these people. The second day, we go back to the, con uh, the uh, compound, we, we leave, we come back the second day to continue building this church, and, and we pull up, and you begin to start to see things a little differently, and you're no longer going, man, I feel so bad for these people. You start to see these kids, and they're running around, and they're playing. They're not inside playing Xbox, but they're outside, and they're kicking the soccer ball around, and they're laughing, and they're playing, and they're cutting up, and they got these huge smiles on their face, and you just kind of go, wow, it's Interesting, they have, they have nothing, but they're just so happy, huh? That's interesting, right? The third day you go back, and then that's when the Lord really starts to do something in your life. And the third day you go back, and there's something within you that begins to be jealous of the people that have nothing. And you start to look at their lives, and you go, man, they're so happy, and they have absolutely nothing. Man, I wish that I could have their life. I know that sounds crazy, that's exactly what happens when you start to be around these people and you get to be around these people that have absolutely nothing. And they're so thankful for the little bit of stuff that they do have. And you go, man, I'm jealous of what they don't have. And then we finished building this kind of just pole barn church that had metal siding and a metal roof on it. And uh, we're gonna do a church service to kind of do a dedication for this squatter village. And so um, we put the church service together. We walk around and we invite all these people in and we're standing in the church service and uh, they're playing music in a language that I don't speak, you know, and they're, they're singing praise songs and they're lifting their hands and they're worshiping. And you just look at these people who have nothing, absolutely nothing, and their hands are raised, their eyes are closed, and they are totally focused in on Jesus. And you go, man, I wish that I had their lives. I wish that I didn't have all the distractions. I wish that I didn't have all the issues in my life that the stuff and possessions and the abundance of things tries to bring my way. I wish that I could just love Jesus the way they love Jesus where they have absolutely nothing, but they understand that in Jesus, they have absolutely everything, that he is more than enough for them. And they're raising their hands and they're praising Jesus. And there's something that in that moment, you go, man, I don't want to leave. I wish that this was my life. And then you come back from the mission trip and you're like, things are going to be different. 
Like we're gonna downsize, we're gonna go live in a hut somewhere, like you know, things are gonna be better, and that's great for about a day and a half. And then you get back into your normal routine and the normal stuff that you got, and eventually that memory kind of fades away. People that have nothing are some of the richest people in the world. We think of wealth as being, you know, the Bill Gateses of the world. The, the Jeff Bezos of Amazon, those are the people that are rich. But being rich really has nothing to do with how much money you have in the bank or how much stuff that you've acquired. Being rich is about being and focusing on what truly matters in life. And that's Jesus, the relationships that we have, and not letting our lives be consumed with the abundance of stuff. Because here's what's true about your life and about my life, that your life is far too important. The mission that God has given us is far too great and our God is far too good for us to be focusing on the abundance and the acquiring of possessions, thinking that they're going to bring us joy and fulfillment in life when they will only bring us emptiness at the end of the day. A quest for more and more stuff. Better is one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. Better is one hand full of a good, solid marriage relationship than two hands where you work day after day and night after night trying to acquire more and more wealth. Better is a great relationship with your children, right? Where you're there and you love them and you're there when, when they get home from school or you're investing in them than, than trying to get more and more stuff. Better is one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and strife. Better is one handful and you're able to make a difference than two handfuls where your life doesn't count for anything. Better is one handful of passion for Jesus than two handfuls of passion for nothing. Your life is far too great. The mission that God has given us is far too important and our God is too good for us to settle for the things of this world and the acquisition of more and more stuff. Your life is more than the abundance of possessions. And if we're ever going to get this right, we've gotta be willing to cut back, to clear out, and to pay back. And if we'll do that, we believe that God will bless our lives and that we'll have more joy even though we have less stuff because Jesus will be our focus rather than the stuff that we have around us. Now, for some of you in the room, you maybe have come to a point where you've turned and you've followed Jesus with your life, but for others maybe in the room where you've maybe made your life all about chasing after getting more and more stuff, the acquisition of, of possessions. Man, if I could just get the new car, if I could get the new house, if I could get the new countertop, so I could get the new boots, if I could get whatever it is, if I could get that, then my life will be happy. And you chased after that and you chased after that and you chased after that and you've always come up empty. And maybe this morning, the message that you need to hear is that the only thing that will truly ever satisfy your soul is Jesus. And this morning, maybe you need to give your life to him for the very first time. A, a series on money and you're gonna come and you're gonna give your heart to Jesus. It sounds crazy, but this is hitting us right where we're at. That our lives are more than the abundance of possessions, but it's about our relationship with God and with others. And so maybe this morning, you need to turn your life over to Jesus and say, God, I've been chasing after the things of this world, trying to acquire more and more stuff. And Lord, I know that this morning, what I've been missing out on is you. And today, I wanna start a relationship with you. And if that's you, we'd love to follow up with you. You can check the box on your encounter card, and we'll give you more information about how to go about doing that and how we can help you walk through that process. But for others of us in the room, um, we probably have an abundance of stuff. And if we were to begin to kind of start this process where we weren't focused on the stuff that we have or maybe the stuff that we don't have and we were able to cut back and clear out and pay back, and I believe that God would open up our eyes and we would be able to focus on him in a greater way. And so maybe you need to take steps of faith this week by cleaning out your closet. Or maybe you need to give stuff away. Maybe you need to have a garage sale. And you're not doing it just so you can have money and just so you can have a clean house. You're doing it so that you can better focus on Jesus and him being your satisfaction and your joy. We'll never be able to do what God has called us to do 
if we don't focus on him 100%, completely trusting in him in everything that we have and who we are. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, that you are a God that truly brings joy. Lord, that so often I'm guilty of filling my life with temporary things and always looking for the quest for more, thinking that more will satisfy my soul. And if I could just get this or if I could just get that, then my life will be complete. And Lord, your word tells us that better is one hand full of tranquility than two hands full of toil and chasing after the wind. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be bold people, that we would take this practical application and we would be willing to understand the principle that less is more and that my joy and my peace and my satisfaction is not tied to the stuff of this world, but it's directly in my relationship and connection with you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would have the boldness to cut out that we'd be, we would be willing to cut back on the things that we spend money on, that before we spend that to get that new shirt or those new boots or to get some remodel thing in our house or buy the new car, before we do any of that, Lord, that we would be able to focus in on you and say, God, is this something that I need? Is this something that I think is gonna ultimately bring me joy? And if it is, then maybe we say no. And it's nothing wrong, Lord, we know with having stuff. We know that it's not wrong to have a house or to have cars or uh, to even have money in our bank account. There's nothing wrong with that. But when our joy and our satisfaction is tied up in those things, Lord, we miss you. And so, Lord, I pray that we are able to focus in on you and not on the stuff around us, that we would be able to live with this attitude of less being more. And Lord, I pray for the individuals here this morning who maybe have never had a started a relationship with you and they've chased after the things of this world thinking that they were gonna get joy and satisfaction out of those things. And this morning, they're maybe uh, being uh, awakened to the thought that those things are never going to bring them joy and peace, but only you can do that. And Lord, if that's somebody in this room, Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, that they would take a step of faith and turn to you as their Savior and their Lord this morning, Lord, that you would come into their life and Lord, that you would give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we thank you again for this morning, for your word, for your truth. And Lord, we say collectively this morning, Lord, that less is more, Lord, that stress is bad, that giving is good and that tomorrow matters. And Lord, I pray that we would believe this with all of our heart, that you are more than enough for us. Lord, we thank you for the word for this time together. In your name we pray, amen.